All right, let me begin. Yes, the time is 8, we can start. So, uh, what we have uh, seen so far, everything we have covered, we saw, we uh, learned about the basic neural network model, some of the genesis of the model, different versions of it, uh, simple feed forward network. Then uh, we saw variants that could be used to scan for patterns, which were the convolutional neural networks, and how we could just use the same thing with for uh, analyzing time series data. And uh, in all of these, uh, we sort of worked with the basic structure that you have the model which uh, uh, analyzes the input and then eventually produces some classification output. Right? But somewhere in between, the model also learns to extract information from data. What exactly does it extract? We're going to look at it from one level, one perspective. So first, uh, here's the basic learning problem again. We keep revisiting this ancient slide, but it's very relevant. It's always relevant. Uh, you're given a problem of, uh, you, you're, the problem is you're given a collection of input-output pairs, just those red lines, the x value and the corresponding y value, and you have to learn the function. And regardless of what, uh, whether you're trying to learn a convolutional network or a recurrent network or a, uh, or a multi-class classifier, the problem is exactly the same. So in reality, you'd be given data of this kind, just colored dots, so to speak, instances with labels. And from the uh, data, you have to learn the boundaries that separate the classes, basically learn the function to the right which sort of gives you a one when the data lies within the desired boundaries and a zero outside. Now, in, again, you're not really ever going to see such data. Most real life data look like this, where you will have some red dots on the blue side, some blue dots on the red side. So uh, uh, it's not cleanly separated, which means that even if you look at the function that the world is presenting to you, it's going to look well. There's my gross attempt at trying to depict how it actually looks on the, on, in the figure to the right, that the boundaries are going to be fuzzy. And very often the entire thing is going to be fuzzy with uh, dominance of one class or the other, but never a clean separation. So you'd get something of this kind in this two-dimensional example, where the function you would try to, for instance, if all you were trying to learn was a two-dimensional uh, logistic, two-class uh, logistic function, the function uh, working on uh, two-dimensional data, the function that you are trying to learn would look like the step function to the right. But the data that you get are going to have uh, the blue dots suspended on the floor on the red side and the red dots hanging in the air on the blue side. So again, the uh, a top-down view of this, you will see that in this figure, there's no nice clean line separating the two sides. You can't say that here's this line, on one side it's all, all red, the other side it's all green. In the one-dimensional case, which is easier to interpret, understand, I'll, uh, here's what it's going to look like. You're trying to build a classifier between red and green uh, classes, red and blue classes over here. Blue represents the class zero, red represents the class one. Now, a linear classifier in one, on one dimension is just a threshold. And as you can see, there is no threshold that's actually going to separate out the red from the blue over here. So, uh, there's, the data are not linearly separable. Now, the problem is your neural network, as we saw, is a universal function approximator. If you presented data of this kind, given a sufficiently large network, it can absolutely learn something of this kind, which means it models your data just fine, perfectly. But is this really what you want? Not really, right? Almost certainly not. This is, uh, this is uh, but even assuming that you're okay with something of this kind, right? Now, suppose I give you a problem of, 
this kind where I have all of this training data and the training data has a collection of uh, red and blue dots at the same location. Now, what is the desired output? Even if you are giving your, giving your network infinite capacity and it can learn all kinds of, uh, uh, all kinds of fluctuations, for this particular data, that is not going to be sufficient, right? So, let us say my training data look like this. I have uh, 10 instances of, of blue and 90 instances of red. You have to learn a function. You have to choose some value. So what would your function value be over here? In your, in your opinion, what would be a reasonable function value? Does it have to be 1 because red dominates or should, be, should it be 0.9 because red occurs 90 percent of the time? What do you think would be most reasonable? Hmm? 0.9 and why would that be? Yeah, it basically tells you what fraction of the data uh, at that location belong to red and what fraction belong to blue. It makes more sense for it to be 0.9. It's more informative. If I just make it one, you're losing the fact that it's not. Uh, you know, the reality is a lot more complex than the value that you actually provided, right? But then, I change this data just a little bit. Instead of having all 900 instances at exactly the same location, I'm going to. So, so basically, what you're saying over here, you're trying to say, uh, you estimate p of one given x. When you say 9.9, .9, it's p of one given x, right? But then, I change the data just a little bit. I nudge the data points a little bit to the left and the right. So they are not all exactly at the same point, but maybe, you know, uh, shifted with respect to each other by a value that's approximately the precision level of a 32-bit floating point. Should the output suddenly change? Even if you have infinite capacity, it doesn't make sense that this should start, you know, the values that are effectively indistinguishable from floating point noise should make your things bounce up and down, right? So uh, given this, what value would you expect it to have? Still 0 0.9. Still 0.9 because that's basically, they're effectively the same value, right? At which point would we begin to decide that the nudge is large enough that 0 0.9 is not a good answer? That doesn't, there's no answer to that, right? Um, now we're beginning to hand wave. But if you just change your perspective and say, what I'm really trying to compute is always a posterior probability, then things change. At each y, at each x, what you're really trying to predict is y given x, p of y given x, right? And, one, and then I can think of, always think of it in terms of trying to estimate the posterior probability. I can look at each, so the uh, posterior probability at any point can be computed from a small window of points, uh, uh, instances around that point. And now, instead of just plotting the target y value that, that the training data gave me, I'm going to change the training data itself, so to speak. I'm going to plot the average value within that range. And so, uh, as you go left to right, in the beginning, all of the values are just blue, so the average remains blue. As I shift right, at some point the red points begin to kick in, so the average begins to slide upwards, and eventually you're going to be in, a, in the region which is all just reds. And so now the average is going to flatten out at the value one. And so the probability of y equals one given x is going to look something like this, and this is the target function that you actually want to estimate. This is the one that actually makes sense, right? So this function, this is the function that we are familiar with. 
if you write out the formula for the function, there are many different formulae which give you the same shape. The one that we use is the simple logistic p of y equals 1 given x is 1 over 1 plus e raised to minus w0 plus w1x, right? Uh, so look at how this, what this function is like. If x is extremely negative, then uh, the denominator becomes 1 plus e raised to minus of an extremely negative number, assuming the w's are positive. And the negative, negative and negative cancel out, so you get 1 over 1 plus e raised to a large number, which is basically 1 over 1 plus infinity, which is 0. So when x is extremely negative, it's actually going to be 0. When an x is extremely positive, e raised to minus of a positive, very large positive number is effectively 0. It's going to be 1 over 1, which is just 1. So it sort of slides from minus infinity to, from 0 at minus infinity to 1 at infinity, which, and uh, this, is, this is really the behavior you would expect to have in that uh, you assume that whatever data you have, whatever classes you have in this simple case, as you go off to one end, the actual class becomes very uh, distinct. At the extremes, the class are distinctive. It's only in the middle that they begin to mix up and get, get somewhat confusing, right? So this is a linear classifier. So if I, uh, the actual perceptron is going to look something like this. It has two parameters, w1 and w0, and what you're computing is p of uh, y equals 1 given x, and it's a linear classifier. It's actually, if I actually want to perform inference and assign a class to the uh, instance, then I'm going to just say, you know, y equals 1 if greater than some threshold. If you just work it out, it's going to be 1 over 1 plus e raised to minus w1x plus w0 is greater than threshold, which will just give you uh, working, working these out, it's going to be uh, theta is less than or theta minus 1 is less than e raised to minus w0 plus w1x, which will give you w1x is greater than something, right? It actually just ends up becoming a threshold. So uh, this one, now what happens when you go up to two dimensions? When we go up to two dimensions, the problem is just the same, except now the function that you're looking at is going to be a, uh, it's going to actually be a function of two variables, right? So your uh, logistic is going to look like so. So it's 1 over 1 plus e raised to minus, and the summation term is summing over two components. And if you actually plot it against the two-dimensional space, you're going to find a that it actually looks like a sheet that's going from 0 to 1. And why would it look like a sheet? Choose any particular value for the output. So let's say I want to specifically get, do you see the chart? Yeah. I want to specific, specifically get 1 over 1 plus e raised to minus w0 plus w1x1 plus w2x2 equals 0.7. If I just work this out, what is the equation I'm going to end up looking like? It's just an like equation for a line, right? So for any particular value of uh, per, per, for any given value, the locus is going to be a line. So as that value changes from minus infinity from 0 to 1, you're just going to get this, these lines which are all parallel to one another. And so the entire uh, figure is going to look like a sheet. And if you decide on any particular threshold and slice it at that threshold and I say I'm going to call it class 1 if this value is 0.7 and I'm going to call it class 0 otherwise, then that threshold is actually going to give you a line. 
And so regard, regardless of the threshold that you use, eventually you're going to get the decision boundaries are going to look like the figure to the right, which means that this classifier is a linear classifier. Although the function is not linear, the classifier is linear. Okay. So how would you estimate this model? Now first, how does this differ from the softmax? You guys are used to the softmax, right? So suppose I, now I can, I can, if I just take the stand, standard softmax model and use a softmax for two classes, what does it look like? What would the equations be? Anyone? Yeah, so what are, yeah, but what are the softmax equations? You're going to get two outputs, right? So how are each of the outputs computed? Remember? Yeah. So do you remember? If I were to do this with the softmax? What is the first step? So lo look at the difference, right? A logistic actually has some input and it has just a single output, right? What would the, what would the corresponding computation be for a softmax? Yeah, but this is, the, the, this is the logistic, right? It has only one output. For the softmax, how many outputs would you have? Two. Two. So what is this structure going to look like? So I have two inputs. I have two outputs. What is the structure going to look like? How many weights will I have? I'm going to have these, and I'm going to have these, correct? And so this is going to be, this is our Z1, this is our Z2, then we had our normalization factor and something coming out. So what is the, can you tell me the relationship between the softmax and the logistic? Just by inspection, anyone? It's just, in fact, this is exactly the same. In the case when you have, uh, so, uh, if you have, the softmax is going to give you e raised to minus w11 x1 plus w12 x2 plus w10 divided by whatever normalization term. If you look at the decision boundary between the two, it's going to be, this is going to be equals e raised to minus w21 x1 plus W22 X2 plus W20 divided by the same normalization factor, correct? So if I, if I relate that to this one, what is the relationship between those weights and, and the weights here? The two class logist, uh, softmax logistic versus the standard logistic. What is the relationship between the weights? This is basically, if I look at this decision boundary, it's not so much a sigmoid, one minus sigmoid, right? If you look at this guy, I can ignore this denominator because it doesn't matter, correct? So I'm saying minus W11X1 minus W12X2 minus W10 equals minus W21X1 minus W22, X2, minus W20, right? I can move the one to the other side, and so this W0 is simply the difference between these two guys. This, this, this W1 has the difference between these two guys. This W2 has the difference between these two guys. It's just the difference between the weights. So your uh, softmax classifier is exactly the same as a logistic. It's a standard multi-class logistic. In fact, you don't need n outputs for a softmax. You could get away with n minus 1, 
and assume that the remaining one is 1 minus the sum of the rest, right? It doesn't really make a difference. Anyway, so how would you go about? I'm going to be using the logistic as my, uh, simple logistic as my, uh, as my uh, example. But you can generalize this to, to higher numbers of classes. So now, how would you estimate this logistic? If I take a step back, stop thinking about neural networks for the moment, standard basic logistic, how would I estimate it? I have the logistic function, p of y given x, is 1 over 1 plus e raised to minus w0 plus w1x, right? And I'm giving you a collection of xy, XY pairs. Then the, uh, so what, the first thing I will need is to be able to write this in a way that actually helps me estimate it properly. So I'm going to write this slightly differently because I'm trying to write p of y given x, right? So if I want, if I want p of y, y given x, I should be able to write this as some function of x and y because there are two variables here. I have to specify x and I have to compute the y. So I'm going to try to write this as a function of x and y, okay? So if I write now, here's how I will write it. I'm going to, instead of using a one zero notation for y, I'm going to use a plus one, minus one. It's still the same thing, it's two classes, correct? And so p of y equals one is one over one plus e raised to minus w zero, whatever, right? p of y equals minus one is, so p of y equals one given x, equals 1 over 1 plus e raised to minus w0 plus w1x. So p, plus, p of y equals minus 1 given x is going to be 1 minus p of y equals 1 given x, right? And that's going to be 1 minus 1 over 1 plus e raised to minus whatever, which is going to become e raised to minus whatever by 1 plus e raised to minus whatever. I can cancel these out, and this, and this will give me 1 over 1 plus e raised to plus the same term. So the only thing that changes between y equals minus 1 and y equals plus 1 is the sign of this argument of the logistic. I can combine the two into one simple formula. I want to say when y is minus 1, the sign is minus one, negative. When the y is plus one, the sign is, or when y is plus one, the sign is negative. When y is minus one, the sign is positive. I can combine the two and say e raised to minus y times this argument. So as you can see, if y is negative, uh, minus and minus become positive, you get the right sign. If y is positive, minus of a positive number retains the sign, right? So this formula over here is the general function that specifies the probability of y given x. It's, uh, and now, the actual training problem looks like this. You're given a collection of training instances, and you want to uh, estimate the parameters of the function. Now, I can look at the total probability of all of my training data. If I assume that all of my training instances are independent, then I just, that's just the joint probability of all of my training instances, which is the product of the probabilities of all of the training instances. Every, for each one, I have the probability of x and y, which I can separate out as the probability of x times the probability of y given x, using the formula we had earlier. And uh, this is the total probability of your training data. Now, if I, where to write the log likelihood, which I just take the log, here I, where I just take the log, this is simply going to be the summations of, summation of the log of p of x minus the summation of the log of the uh, one plus e raised to the denominator of the logistic, right? And now we all know our, uh, machine learning, if I give you some, a model for the probability distribution for some data, and if, if I give you a bunch of training data, you try to maximize the likelihood. 
you try to maximize the likelihood because you know that when, the like, when you maximize the likelihood, the fit of the model to your data is maximized, right? And so all you would really be doing is uh, maximizing the likelihood, which is to say find W0 and W1, which maximize the likelihood of the training data, or alternately minimize the negative likelihood of the training data. And if you actually look at that function, this ends up looking very, very familiar. This is just your standard KL divergence that you use for training your neural network. So in other words, when you're training the neural network, if you're training a simple logistic, what you're using a KL divergence, you're actually using a maximum likelihood estimator to estimate the function parameters of a function that computes the a posteriori probability of your classes given the training, given the data right so this is simple enough now what about this funky case if i have data which are linearly separable or a threshold uh, function uh, or uh, you know something that can be separated by threshold or a line i can just use a logistic this data these data are not linearly separable these are fuzzy right but firstly the boundaries are not lines they're not hyperplanes so and before considering this let's look at a slightly more slightly simpler version of it which is this guy which is perfectly linearly separable i mean perfectly separable but not linearly separable right now we know how to build handcraft a neural network for this for this problem how many neurons would this uh, handcrafted neural network for this problem have anybody remember what is the network structure you had 5 for the first pentagon 5 for the second pentagon and then you combine the two right so you had uh, 10 plus 2 plus 1 11 neurons now here is the sufficient network this can you can actually learn uh, larger networks but this is going to learn this is sufficient right so now first consider this this guy has a perceptron at the final uh, classification uh, level, level right and what kind of a classifier is a perceptron hmm? it's a is it a linear or a nonlinear classifier the perceptron by itself is a linear classifier, correct? And so this guy here, that perceptron is a linear classifier over the features, over, over these values that you derive from the penultimate layer, right? So given this, the, if I know that I have this perfect classifier, I have the exact parameters, which will classify this function to the left perfectly. What can I say about the representation of the data just before the perceptron? Linear, linear. They are going to be linearly separable, otherwise the perceptron could not have separated the two classes, correct? And so over here, this is, for per perfect classification, the output of the penultimate layer must be linearly separable. So in other words, if I just captured the y1 and y2 values just before the perceptron and plotted those, you're going to get a figure like the one to the left, right? So in other words, the network actually consists of two components, the linear classifier on the top and the rest of the network, which does something very interesting. It takes this entangled data, disentangles it, and transforms it to linearly separable features. Right? How many of you are familiar with the notion of a VC dimension? So the VC dimension, some of you must have taken the machine learning class, right? So anybody heard the term? Yeah. Okay, what does it mean? It's how many, um, <coughs> how many kind of areas you can separate? Uh, the VC dimension of a classifier basically uh, 
quantifies how complex the classifier is in some sense. So if you have, and the way it does it is it uh, speaks in terms of shattering. So if I have uh, n data points, right, how many different ways can I group the data and still have the uh, classifier separate the data? So for example, when I have two-dimensional data, then two-dimensional data can be, so long as they're not coplanar, I can make this, the, I can separate the classes like this and draw a line like so, right? I can separate the classes like this and draw a line like so. If I have only three points, I can always separate them using a line. But if I have four points, there's a case where I cannot separate them. If the diagonals are one class, right? So the VC dimension of this classifier is going to be three. In, the, in general, if I have a d-dimensional data, then a linear classifier in d dimensions can have a largest uh, VC dimension of d plus one. And the generalization bound that, that is usually stated, that can be provably shown to be true is that with some probability, if your empirical error on the training data is something, the excess error that you can expect to get on the test data is proportional to the square root of the VC dimension times the log of the VC dimension. Basically, the larger the VC dimension, the more the uh, more complex the net classifier gets, the more error it can make on test data because the more it will overfit your training data. Now, over here, what is the VC dimension of this classifier? Hmm? Three, the network can be arbitrarily complex. It doesn't matter. The dim VC dimension of the classifier is just three. Right? So now, suppose I give you a different network over here where I have a network which is something arbitrarily complex. I'm trying to represent complexity with, a, with an ugly figure. And then you have a penultimate layer which has, say, 100 neurons and then your decision, decision, decision neuron. What would the VC dimension of this neural network be? At most 101. It's performing linear classification on 100 dimensions. It doesn't matter how complex the stuff underneath is. It, it, it is zapping everything down to 100 dimensions. It's trying to separate stuff in a 100 dimensional space, right? So the VC dimension is at most 101. So there's a very nice way of actually placing an upper bound on what these things can be. It doesn't matter whether it's a recurrent net or a convolutional network or an you know, LSTM or something that's based on attention. It doesn't matter at all what it is. The fi if the final classifier is a linear classifier, then the VC dimension is basically at most D plus one, where D is the, the dimensionality of the representation it's actually working on. Anyway, going back to our problem, so the network actually over here consists of two parts. It's got the linear classifier, which is the actual classifier, and the second part is everything underneath it, which is just a feature extractor. It's operating on your data, and it's manipulating the data such that the data become linearly separable. So it's extracting linearly separable features from the data. So now, this is true of any sufficient structure, right? In the specific problem that we had, the, uh, the features were actually separable. And so, in fact, here's something I could do. If I think of the box underneath as a feature extractor and the classifier on top, as just a linear classifier. Then so long as I'm able to extract linearly separable features from my data, it doesn't matter what linear classifier I'm putting on top. So the guy on top could be an SVM, for instance. It doesn't have to be a perceptron. It could be any linear classifier that you can cook up and can sit on top of this box, which, whose only job in life is to extract linearly separable classifiers. So we can sort of decompose this more complex, more kind of fuzzy notion of a neural network 
into this uh, this uh, this uh, uh, segregation of parts, which actually allows you to you know, helps you generalize the uh, structures that that you might come up with. Now, think of the more general case where the data are not linearly separable. So instead of having something uh, where, where the red is all on the red side and the blue is all on the blue side and you can always generate something of this kind, right? Uh, you might have problems like the one that we saw where I have red and blue values at the same location. But even if not, actually let's take a step back. Uh, even over here, suppose I didn't actually give you 10 neurons in the first layer and two neurons in the second layer. I gave you f nine neurons in the first layer and two in the second. Now the network is not sufficient for this particular problem, right? So that network cannot separate it. Then what do you think the network would be doing in this case? Remember that when the classes are separable, the network is trying to learn how to make them, transform them into linearly separable classes. And then you have the linear, the linear classifier operating on the, the outcome. When the network does not have the capacity to separate the data out, it is still going to try to manipulate the data so that it becomes as linearly separable as possible and then finally plug a linear classifier on top of it. This is still going to try to maximize the linear separability of the data as quantified by not your error but your KL divergence because that is what we actually use, right? So mathematically, let us say you have, the, you have this uh, uh, output. The output is your logistic, as we saw in the two, two, two uh, class problem. Then the data will be almost linearly separable in the space of Y, where Y is the output of the feature extraction portion of the network. And the network until the second to last layer will just be a nonlinear function that converts the input space of X into the feature space Y, where the classes are maximally linearly separable. And the restriction really on whether it manages to successfully do so is based on two things. One is the dimensionality of the feature space itself. The other is the actual capacity of the network underneath. And depending on its capacity, it's going to try to make it, it's, it's going to uh, succeed to different degrees in making the classes linearly separable. So a classification MLP actually comprises two components. It, it has a uh, feature extraction network that converts the inputs into linearly separable features and a final or, or nearly linearly separable features and a final linear classifier that operates on the linearly separable features, right? Now, yes? So uh, uh, in principle, you should be able to make, you, sh you should be able to uh, collapse everything into just one line and separate everything. In practice, it's not going to be, e the, the uh, transformation that achieves that is going to be a lot more complex than something that collapses it to two dimensions. And that in turn is going to be more complex than something that collapses it to three dimensions. If I have 100 classes, I can always separate them now to different regions of a single line, right? So the larger the dimensionality of the feature space that you actually provide, the less the work the function underneath has to do to make the data linearly separable in that space. Like I don't think how many neurons we have in a Yes, exactly. Which in turn, again, we saw it depends, relates to the VC dimension, right? It's a good question. Anyway, so uh, everybody good with me so far? Right. Which means, and this is something that you guys have all, might have already encountered, for binary problems, using an SVM with Slack may be more effective than a final perceptron. Those we know tend to be 
more uh, robust as classifiers. So you can actually train your neural network to optim optimize a margin based loss rather than your standard, standard loss or you can just do other things. You can use your neural network in the standard way to train linea uh, linearly separable, learn li uh, linearly separable features and subsequently use the box underneath as a feature, trans a feature extractor which extracts these separable features from which you learn some other linear classifier like an SVM, something that you think might be more robust. But the point being that the box underneath actually ends up trying to separate the classes and make them linearly separable. It's a feature extractor, right? But then what if I go one step below the penultimate layer? What is that extracting? Right. I can keep going down all the way to the very earliest layer and ask questions about what do I expect to see over here. And what you are really expecting to see is to, to see some features that are separable by the rest of the network. So you can always think of the network as a feature extractor and a nonlinear classifier, but that classifier becomes more and more linear as you go towards the, the, the other final layer. At the final layer, you just have the linear classifier, right? So in other words, if you separated the network in this manner, where you thought of what came out of this box as the feature extractor and everything else as the classifier, then what comes out of this box must be classifiable by the downstream network. Except that's not a very nice way of thinking about it simply because the rest of the classifier, which is downstream, is not linear and so, so often not interpretable. But there's a different way of thinking about it, we can th which, is to st uh, which uh, seems to actually be uh, a reasonable uh, approximation to what really goes on in that at the input, the data may not be linearly separable. Then the first layer sort of takes it up into some, some higher dimensional space in this particular example. But as the input progresses through the network, the data become more and more linearly separable. Now in the very first, uh, second lecture, we saw that uh, if you want to keep the network, if you, want to, if you want to use threshold functions, for instance, then you want the second layer of the network to have as many neurons as possible because otherwise you will not be able to extract information downstream. What really is happening when you begin, when you have a second layer with a large number of features, a large number of neurons, when you have a second layer with a large number of neurons, you're sort of boosting your data into some high dimensional space and so on some curved manifold in some higher dimensional space. And now in that higher dimensional space, you can begin to uh, twist and turn that manifold so that the classes become separable. Now, if you've done your machine learning class, again, you learn, you, you know, you work with kernels and such like, you throw your data up into a higher dimensional space and work off the higher dimensional space. That's basically what's happening over here. You have to go into a higher dimensional space where you can now manipulate it in order to make it linearly separable. And that is basically indeed what ends up happening. So uh, even if you're looking at uh, tall, narrow function networks, eventually you're just adding dimensions to the whole thing and, and, and twisting it and then straightening the whole thing out. So uh, here is a very simple example which shows you exactly what's happening. This is a, uh, the uh, decision boundary is the circle. What they really want is uh, a, uh, a class one inside the circle and a class two, class zero outside. And look at what's happening. The first thing that happens in this network, it's going up from two dimensions to three and then it's going up to one. It's boosting, up to two, boosting it up to three dimensions. So you get this sheet and you're going to spread it out, but the classes are still not linearly separable, right? But now that you've gone up into the higher dimensional space, you can take the center of the circle and pull it out. And when you take the center of the circle and pull it out, now I can slice it. And now it becomes linearly separable, right? And if you look at exactly how the entire network is operating, this is the uh, this is the decision boundary in the, in the original space, the, the figure to the right. Uh, the figure to the left, first it's taking it uh, into a higher dimensional space, which is three dimensions, and then projecting it down to one 
and then you are performing a classification on it, right? And look at what is happening. As it, out, as it trains, it sort of grabs the center of the circle, it pulls it out, and then when you project it down, it also finds the line on which you must project the circle after the center has been pulled out. And if you find the right line, then all the blues are going to end up on one side, all the reds are going to end up on the other side. Very pretty, right? And so that is exactly what happens. The three-dimensional figure, you can see what has happened. It sort of pulled the thing out. And then if you look at what happens to the left, eventually the uh, red and the blue are separated. Now, it is not doing a perfect job because obviously whatever activation function has been used over here is not able to pull the entire circle up perfectly. It depends on the activation function that you use but the actual operation itself becomes obvious, right? Uh, here's, uh, or let's look at a, a slightly more complex problem. This is CIFAR, CIFAR 10. And this is a uh, 1, 2, 3, this is a 12 layer network. And you can see how the classes look like. They've been project, the data have been projected down to two dimensions. And you can see that initially in two dimensions, all the data are completely mixed up, right? But then as you go through the network, you can see how the representation begins to separate out. And you can see what has happened eventually as you go. Uh, the, here's the interesting thing. As you go through the network, observe that the classes get more and more separated out and they become more and more linearly separable. In this particular case, by the time you got here, they're already separable. The next few layers are just sort of manipulating them a little bit. And actually, let's see this in three dimensions and you will, you will see this even better. The actual da data are uh, higher dimensions, obviously, right? And you can see what's happening here is that they begin, it begins twisting and turning the data, increasing the separability. By the time you get to uh, the uh, this 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 place, they're actually almost linearly separable. Here they are. Each of the classes has ended up in a different plane, sort of. And then finally, over here, in the last one, they're actually sort of separable, right? So. Uh, you can, again, you get an idea of what really is, how the whole thing operates in principle, at least. But this also gives you an intuition of how you must architect your networks. Whatever feature extraction and modeling you do must enable this to happen. Otherwise, your network is not going to be able to extract fe useful features from it. Yes? Uh, if we want the data to become more linearly separable in every layer, uh, why not explicitly force it to like a lot function at every layer to make it more linear? What the, the problem is, it's not going to be possible for you to. Uh, there is no. Think about an XR. XR. Mm -hmm. There's no way that you can actually make it linearly separable in one layer. It just doesn't exist, right? So, so. In the last few layers, we can see that uh, it is somewhat linearly separable. If we can add some additional signal on top of that to make it. That's a perfectly reasonable thing to be trying. Okay. All right. But you're going to have to pull the features out through a separate classifier. But that's actually, that's actually worth a try. Give it a shot. Right. And uh, everybody with me so far? Right. It, this, is, this is interesting stuff. What happens when the data are not linearly separable, which is a more typical setting for classification problems? Everything we saw, there's a, even the CIFAR, they were largely separ separable, right? So in inseparable problems with an output logistic uh, perceptron, what happens, is it's still going to try to make it separable, but eventually what it's going to learn is, uh, it's going to learn the a posteriori probability for, somebody you got to go, go wash, wash your face. <laughs> uh, it's going to learn the uh, uh, a posteriori probability for the classes, right? And since the final function is a logistic, it's going to try to manipulate the data such that a logistic can actually model the a posteriori probabilities properly. But the network eventually is a maximum likelihood estimator. The, the network training is just using KL divergence. It's basically a maximum likelihood uh, estimation process where, it's tra where, where it is learning the parameters of the network such that the output actually captures P of Y given X. Right. Just to 
set the perspective right. This is true regardless of whether you are doing this with a two class problem or a multi class with a softmax. So, here is what you would have the feature extraction layer transforms the data such that the posterior probability might not be modeled by a logistic. The output logistic computes the posterior probability of the class given the input. And when the data are not separable and the boundaries are not linear, the output of the network is still P of Y given X. And in this case, it is going to be a vector of probabilities. But eventually, the estimation process is still something that tries to estimate P of Y given X as, as accurately as possible as modeled by the network itself, right? Questions? Yes. The data are not linearly separable for as in the case of, case of the uh, circle, right? What happened is you transformed it to something that where it became linearly separable, right? Right. Have you? Has anyone read this book, Illusions? I highly recommend it. It's a fun book. It's an old book by this guy called Richard Bach, who wrote books called Jonathan Livingston Seagull and Illusions. It's about the it's the handbook of the reluctant, uh, the adventures of a reluctant messiah. And he's got a uh, messiah's messiah's handbook with lots and lots of advice. And then the last line in the book is this: Everything in this book might be wrong. <laughs> that holds for pretty much everything we say in life. So to answer your question. What's stopping me from saying this is the correct function again? Right. In principle, so long as I don't have two training data instances which have exactly the same x value with different y values, I can always construct a function that will make the classes linearly separable. Right. While at it, so here's an interesting problem. Suppose I have a training data set. So I'm sort of getting diverted a little bit, but this is a fun problem. I give you, I have a training data set of some n training instances, and I have my features, right? This is F1 through FD, and this is my label Y, and my training instances xn. Can you construct a network for me that will memorize this table? And how complex is it going to be? Assume for simplicity that y is binary. I want a network that just memorizes the table. It doesn't work very hard. Mm-hmm. Pardon me? Well, how will But how will that neuron be? Yes. Each neuron basically predicts whether that training sample has uh, exists, uh, whether it is that training sample. So, so what what kind of structure is that neuron going to be? It's just uh, what's, uh, because it's distance based, right? But again, positive and negative distances are different. So I can give you something very simple. All of these guys are right. But then let's say I have plus, plus, minus, minus, plus, something of this kind, right? Then I can just make 
just set on the pluses alone. So the maximum number of pluses for the binary class is going to be d over 2 because I can always flip the n over 2, right? And so uh, in the worst case, if I'm, doing, if I'm drawing a box, I'm going to need about uh, n times d planes to isolate all the positives and then I have one more r. I can, you can do this with n plus 1, but you can literally memorize any training set with a network that's not much larger, that, that is about the same size as the size of the training set. So if you think about the uh, many of the problems that we actually deal with where the network size is sometimes larger than the training data, very often larger than, larger, larger than the training data. And observe that this is independent of the dimensionality of the features, right? So the size of the network, I can make it proportional to actually just n rather than n times d even. And this is independent of the dimensionality of the features. So if I'm training a, an image net classifier with 1 million images, but the classifier has 1 billion neurons, it's more than enough neurons to memorize exactly what every image must be classified as, and yet be a completely bullshit classifier. Right. There's more that happens here. Maybe this is some time, we should spend some time on it later. But let me just go ahead with the class, OK? So I'm going to change gears to, uh, yeah. We've seen what happens to the network out here. We've seen what happens to the network uh, at the intermediate layers. But what about at the very first layer, let's say, right? I'm just using the first layer as an example. Remember the basic perceptron. I'm still speaking of the threshold-based perceptron, but this can be extended to other kinds of perceptrons. You, then perceptron fires if the input, if the, if the uh, inner product between the weights and the input is greater than a threshold, right? So what exactly does that mean? Now here is a shocking fact for you. In high dimensional spaces, all vectors are the same length. So, uh, and I've mentioned this before. If I take a high enough dimensional space, then if I take a sphere of any size, then pretty much the entire volume of the sphere lies within a, within a very small, very, very, very small uh, space of the uh, distance from the surface of the sphere. So as the dimensionality keeps increasing for an infinite dimensional sphere, the entire volume of the sphere is on the surface of the sphere which really means that all the vectors are pretty much the same length in an infinite dimensional sphere. Or, the, or rather, the fraction of vectors that are not all the same length is going to be very small. So which means that in high dimensional space, if I take, say, a weights vector and an input vector, they are approximately the same length. The inner product between the weights vector and the vector x is simply the cosine of the uh, angle between the two vectors, right? And so the perceptron is going to fire if the inner product exceeds a threshold. In other words, it's going to fire if the cosine of the angle exceeds a threshold, or alternately, if the angle is less than a threshold. So I have a weights vector, and you have this feature vector. If the feature vector is completely aligned with the weights vector, it's going to fire. As it keeps going further and further out, it's less and less likely to fire. Eventually, it's going to exactly fire. It's going to stop firing. Now, this goes back to, was it, who was it who said that it, you, yeah, that was you, right? This goes back to exactly your statement, right, about how I would memorize a table. If the theta is zero, you will capture it, correct? So that's why I said you're right, but I was asking you how. Anyway, so this one. So which means it's really a correlation filter, right? If I'm trying to build a classifier which classifies this number two on a pixel grid, then my weights really must just be just the number two. Then if I get a pattern like the figure in the middle, the correlation between the weights, which is the inner product between the weights and the input is only about 0.57, it's too low at 1.5. Whereas if I have the figure to the right, the correlation is much higher and that's going to be 0.82 in this case, and if, the, if you choose your threshold accordingly, that, that neuron will fire. So 
Uh, a simple correlation filter can capture very complex patterns, although it's just a linear classifier, right? Now, so in an MLP, going back to what the uh, what we uh, have always been discussing, the lowest layer captures all of the features of the uh, significant features in the input, and the subsequent layers actually work off the features. Now, each neuron is a feature detector, right? It detects a specific kind of pattern. And literally the weights of the neuron tell you what pattern it's looking for. So if I were, try, if I were to look at a, uh, build a classifier which looked at this little grid of pixels, and its job in life was to tell you if it was the, the pixel pattern represented a valid digit or not, then you'd expect the lowest level features to capture characteristics of features, of digits. And then the next level of the network to actually combine these to see if these look, actually look like digits. And if any of these is a digit, it's actually, it will fire, right? Now, that means that the guys at the bottom capture features, right? So if this guy fires, I know that the input has a horizontal line. If, I, if this guy fires, I know that the input has a horizontal line in the middle. So if just by looking at the excitations of these neurons and their weights, can I reconstruct the input? Every, one, every neuron is actually giving you information about the input, about patterns in the input. So again, going back to the memorization uh, logic, if I find specific patterns in the input, I can recompose at least part of the input using just those patterns, and I should be able to somewhat reconstruct the input, right? So, uh, well, will this work in this particular case? You're only able to detect things that relate to whether it's a, whether it's a digit or not, right? Things that are not related to the classification between digits and non-digits are not detected. So it can only construct, reconstruct things that are clearly digit-like or clearly not digit-like, but the fuzzy stuff are not going to get reconstructed in this case. You sort of will get something that may look like a cleaned up version of the input. So here, the network is optimized to recognize digits, will only retain distinctly digit-like or obviously not digit-like features and the rest are irre irrelevant and will be lost. Let me try to make this explicit. Let me say I want to actually reconstruct the input. This is what we'll call an autoencoder. You can train a neural network to predict its own input. And basically the output you say must be the same as the input, so this is the autoencoder. This has two components, the encoder, which learns all the most significant patterns in the input, and the decoder, which recombines the signals from these patterns. Now, the simplest autoencoder of this kind is going to be something of this kind, a single hidden unit, just one hidden unit, right? Features go in, there's one single unit, it fires, and features come out, and uh, it tries to reconstruct the input. Now, what will this guy learn? What will this guy learn? The average value? Of all the input excitations. The input. Of all the input what will the, okay. Think about it. What is it going to try to reconstruct? It, again, depends on the divergence. But let's say I'm trying to minimize the L2 divergence, right? If, I, if I'm trying to minimize the L2 divergence, what is it actually going to try to reconstruct? Let's say I have data of this kind. And these are the training data that I provide, right? Your weights vector has some value, and that weights vector is being scaled by the, by the output of the hidden neuron, right? So in other words, the output is always going to be some stretching of this weights vector. 
So, and the error that you're computing is this guy. So, assuming no no output activation, you can we can always factor in an output output activation. What you are really doing is you are learning the weights of the output are going to learn the the output weights are going to learn the principal component of your input space, right? So to make this explicit, let's try the try uh, try this with a linear activation. If I'm trying to learn this with linear activations, all of the neurons have linear activations. And let's say the input, you're detecting an input. So you're detecting a pattern. And then you're trying to reconstruct the pattern. So the input weights and the output weights are the same, right? What you would really be learning is Wx is going to be the combination coming in. W transpose Wx is what is being reconstructed. Your minima, the error is x minus the reconstruction, which is x minus W transpose Wx, whole squared. And if you're minimizing that, that will simply give you a standard eigenvalue equation, right? You're literally just saying, find me the, so, but the way to think about it is W transpose, the output weights are the, are the, represent the typical vector that you can actually construct. And so if this is the W, W transpose, then all of the reconstructions are going to be extensions of this W transpose. The error is going to be you can never reconstruct anything that's not an extension of this guy. The error is going to be this line. The squared error is going to be the squared length of that line. And that is what you're minimizing. If, that is, if your data are, uh, have, are centered at 0, solving this equation is simply exactly principal component analysis. So when you have just one hidden neuron, it's actually just going to be performing PCA. So uh, something else which is going to be for a zero, zero mean RV, it's basically going to be finding the direction of lowest variance, right? But here's something else that happens. Now suppose I train this network and uh, look at the outputs. The outputs of this network can only be extensions of this vector. It cannot reconstruct anything that's not an extension of the vector, which is the weights vector, right? So basically, all input vectors, regardless of what input you provide, are going to be mapped on to this simple principal axis, right? Now, which means that if I just take the decoder portion of this network, or the, the reconstruction portion of the network, throw away the input, Right, start from the hidden unit. And I keep exciting the hidden unit, hidden unit with different uh, values. The output is always still going to still be on this line because that's all it can reconstruct. Right? So this is going to happen even if the input and output weights are different. If you don't say that you know the input weights and output weights have to be the same, you get rid of this restriction. You're still going to be estimating outputs. I mean, if I want to approximate any data point by some by the extension of a vector, then the only vector which results in the lowest error is going to be the principal component vector, which means you, the output reconstruction vector, is guaranteed to be the principal component vector. Everybody with me so far? Right. Now, what happens if I have many hidden neurons? What do you expect will happen over here? No, no activation. The activations are still linear activations. What would happen? Pardon me? In this case, it's going to be correspond to the space composed by the top four principal components. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get the four principal component, components themselves, but you're going to reconstruct the space that's composable by the top four principal components. And this means that the output layer will always lie in this principal subspace. Regardless of the input you provide, the output is going to be in this principal subspace. In our terminology, the portions that actually, this lower portion of the network that composes the, computes the 
reduced dimensional uh, representation of the input. We'll call it an encoder. The portion that reconstructs the input from these reduced dimensional representations are going to be, is going to be called a decoder. So the uh, encoder <coughs> analyzes the input, the synthesizer, synthesizer generates the output, and the output must be the same as the input. Now, when the data have linear activations, you are only sub, the only thing you can do is to extract linear manifolds, right? What happens if I replace the linear activations with nonlinear activations everywhere? When I have nonlinear activations, now the functions begin to get curved. So in this case, what it really ends up doing is that the net and the network ends up performing nonlinear principal component analysis. So it's actually going to be able to, uh, if, the out, if the output activations and the hidden activations are all nonlinear, it's actually going to be, it will reconstruct whatever the output activations can reconstruct. The output activations would be some kind of a nonlinear manifold. The rest of the network is going to be performed finding the location, closest location on the nonlinear manifold that can reconstruct the data. You're basically performing nonlinear principal component analysis. Right? So, and the more complex the decoder, the more complicated the nonlinear manifold it can reconstruct. And so, uh, the more complex the nonlinear PCA you can perform. This is the deep autoencoder. Doesn't always work. Here are some examples. Uh, this is a two dimensional case, right? And all the training data are provided, uh, that were provided are on the spiral. Now, what is the underlying nonlinear manifold? It's actually the spiral. And so here we've actually got in this particular example, uh, two hidden layers of 100 neurons each in the decoder and also in the encoder. And the decoder ideally would be reconstructing a spiral. There's only one degree of variation which is the position along the spiral, right? Which means that I need only one hidden, neur hidden neuron. And that hidden neuron's output must give you the location on the spiral. And if I pass it through the rest of it, the decoder must reconstruct the spiral. And if this is doing a good job, then on the training data, the hidden value, z, is going to take some range of values, say between zero and three, right? But then if you continue beyond three or go below zero, you expect to be able to, to be continuing this spiral. What really happens is that within the training data, it actually learns the spiral, but it even manages to capture the small little gaps between training instances. So if you vary the z continuously, then you see the horizontal line and the blue line over there. Those are z values that were not seen in the training data. And the actual manifold that it ends up learning is not exactly the uh, spiral that you want, but some extra gunk, and it also doesn't generalize outside the network. But in but you get the idea that at least within the training data, it's actually capturing the underlying nonlinear manifold. Or here's another example. This is a sinusoid, and the network again has a, a sufficient structure to learn a sinusoid. There's only one degree of variation going left to right. You expect that as you keep going right, it will continue to reconstruct the sinusoid. That's not what happens. It just goes off and shoots off into some uh, 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 linearly in some direction, right? Anyway, there's an interesting aspect to it. Suppose you had actually trained this network and the network were perfectly trained. Then as you kept increasing Z, you would expect to keep reconstructing the clean sinusoid and not shooting off in random directions, right? Under those ideal circumstances, what you expect is that the, uh, the, uh, he, that the hidden representation captures, which we will call the bottleneck layer, captures the position on this nonlinear manifold that the data lie in, and uh, if properly trained, and that the uh, encoder will actually find the position of any training input the decoder can reconstruct the location on that on that uh, uh, on the manifold, but then something else happens, which is that 
the decoder can now only generate data on the manifold that the training data lie on. It cannot generate things outside this manifold. We can actually, which means I can now, now actually use it as an excellent way to generate data on the training manifold. And something that if I just take this decoder, this can only generate data if well trained. We saw that it can, you know, does it always generalize properly. It will only generate data on the training manifold, which means that if I just take the decoder and I provide different inputs to the decoder, which is basically at the Z layer, regardless of what Z I produce, provide it, the output is going to be on this manifold, right? So if I were to do, do an autoencoder, train an autoencoder on the digits data, varying Z should ideally be giving me generating different variants of, the, of digits. And here's a nice little example. Here we actually trained an autoencoder on uh, a saxophone, music from a saxophone. Now, having generated music, from, learned it from music from a saxophone, you expect that the decoder can only generate stuff that looks like, sounds like something that might come from a saxophone, right? So we actually tried, tried this. We uh, had this network, and on the decoder, in one case, we activated the uh, neuron that's highlighted. In another case, we activated it uh, with, with some other random vector. It generates some output. And from the spectrogram, you can re reconstruct sound. Here's what it sounds like. If it'll play. What happened? This never fails. That Wasn't the sound playing just now? There's something wrong with the sound. It's not. Bear with me a few minutes. I'm going to go a few minutes over just so I can, exp you know, it's an interesting little example. There's three minutes of example and five minutes of fixing. So let me try this, check if the thing at the end works. We tried this. And now it's not working. OK, thank you. So you can see that if I just excite this thing with randomly, it produces something. It's been trained using a saxophone. If I excite this thing randomly, it sounds like not a pure saxophone note, but something that could have been played by a saxophone, right? I excite it with a different pattern. This is what it sounds like. But now here's a very similar musical instrument. This is a clarinet. It actually ends up sounding very different, like something that might have been played by from a clarinet. Or here's a random. So you, do you see how this works? It actually sort of learns the manifold of the data. It's only able to generate things from the manifold if properly trained. And it turns out the more complex your decoder is, uh, the more exactly it tries to, it's able to learn these patterns. And here's a cute little application I'll close up with. Signal separation, I like to play with this particular problem. If you're a given, given a mixed sound from multiple sources, like music, people singing, you want to separate out the individual sources, right? So there's something called diction, there's some dictionary based, uh, there's an approach that's, that we like to call dictionary based. The basic idea is to learn a dictionary of building blocks for the sounds from each source. So for example, if you're uh, trying to separate drums from a guitar, you'd learn all about guitar notes somehow. And so you end up building a machine that can only produce guitar notes. Then simultaneously, you'd learn and train a separate machine which learns how to produce drum notes. And you'd end up learning a machine that only produces drum notes. And now given a mixed recording, you can algebraically sort of decompose the combination to say, you know, how do I excite this drum dictionary and this guitar dictionary such that when I sum their outputs, it sounds like what I just saw, okay? And in our case, that's, and then once I do that, I know how to 
excite the uh, guitar dictionary, I know how to excite the drum dictionary, I can just generate the separated sounds, right? So uh, basically the problem is to identify the combination of entries from both dictionaries that compose the mix signal. This we can do with our neural networks. I can actually train an autoencoder for my guitar. And now the decoder for the guitar can only generate guitar sounds. I can train an autoencoder for my drums. And the decoder from the drums can only generate drum sounds, right? Subsequently, if I get something that's a mixture of a guitar and a drum, I've got to figure out how to excite my decoder, decoder, guitar decoder, and how to excite my drums decoder, such that when you sum their outputs, I get the mixed signal. Now observe that what this really means is that I must learn how to, what are the inputs to the decoder, which is the central bottleneck that we trained, for, used to, tra uh, that we learned for the uh, guitar. And the, similarly, I must learn how to excite the decoder for the drums. So in other words, I must learn, I must estimate the eyes such that the outputs when summed give me my test recording. And how would we estimate the eyes? Anyone? How is this different from anything you've done? This is just straight up back propagation, right? Remember, when you do back propagation, you can come, come back propagate gra gradients all the way to the input of the network. And so you know, given an output, you can learn an input that generates the output. It's not just for learning parameters of the network. You can also use this for learning the input to the network for a given output. And so here, you would actually learn the inputs to the two decoders. That such, such that when the two are some, some, their outputs are summed, it sounds like the mixed signal. And subsequently, you're given some mixed signal. You're going to learn the eyes such that the outputs of the two decoders when summed give you the mix, uh, the mix spectrogram. And of course, the outputs of the individual decoders are the separated sounds, right, from each, from each source. Let's see how this works. So here is a, the two instruments, two wind instruments. It's a violin and a wind instrument, I think, okay? And uh, let's see. That's with one guy. It actually works quite nicely, surprisingly, considering the simplicity of the entire scheme, right? Uh, and here are the originals for reference. Anyway, just an interesting little application. So closing, the story for the day, classification networks learn to predict a posteriori probabilities of the networks, of the classes. The network until the final layer is a feature extractor that converts input data to be almost linearly separable. And then the final layer is a classifier or predictor that operates on these linearly separable or nearly linearly separable data to either perform classification or to compute the a posteriori probability of the classes. But then the network itself learns to capture key components of the input, features from the input. And in principle, those features could be recomposed to reconstruct the input itself. And in, in fact, you can think of the entire network as performing some kind of nonlinear principal component analysis where it learns the underlying manifolds that capture the nature of the distribution of the data or the, uh, or the uh, uh, structure of the data. And the complexity of this manifold depends entirely on the decoder that reconstructs the uh, data. And the hidden representation that you get is going to be detect finding the position on the manifold that the decoder reconstructs that best uh, 
represents any given data. So uh, again, if you have an auto encoder for this kind where the decoder and encoder are exactly the same, uh, just, just inverses of one another, then you can think of this, uh, the hidden representation is effectively linearizing this nonlinear manifold because you have this curved space and you want to, f there are two aspects to it, find the position on the curved space and then reconstruct the input from the position. So when you're finding the position, you can think of it as linearizing this curved space. The decoder is reconstructing the curved space. Uh, here to here, we saw an example of how on being only able to generate data on a restricted manifold can be used for some purposes. But being able to un unfold these manifolds into something planar has many more uses. And uh, uh, we'll see how this can actually be extended for generative models in a couple of lectures. We're out of time. Thank you.